it's not an accident that I am here in this room right now with a message from the inventor and creator and sustainer and ruler of the entire universe. Right here and right now. It's also not an accident that Psalm 91 is right after Psalm 90. Now that might sound like I'm being a wise guy with that, but Psalm 90, the inspired text told us and tells us that it's a prayer of Moses. And we, we prayed that prayer last Sunday. Now then Psalm 90 comes along and there's nothing at all prior to verse 1 telling us who, what the, who the human author of this psalm was, what the occasion was, or anything like that. But nevertheless, the Holy Spirit of God superintended Psalm 90 to follow, 91 that is, to follow Psalm 90 in our Psalter, that is the book of Psalms, as we have it. And as I mentioned last week, many, many times in the counseling room, around the counseling table, we find that the root of our anxiety, the root of our depression, the root of our sadness, our anger, those things that trouble us, and addiction too, it makes me think of uh, Celebrate Recovery video that we just saw. The root of the majority of those ills is our incorrect understanding of who God is. And in Psalm 90, Moses prayed that prayer and he prayed, God, you are eternal and we are but a vapor. And last Sunday, we were trying to get our heads around, well, what, does he, what is eternal? It's everything we know about, everything that, that we've seen and heard and smelled and tasted and touched. It has a beginning and somewhere down the line has an end. But not God. He has no beginning, he has no end. And we tried to wrap our heads around that last Sunday. And then, as if that weren't enough, we tried to think about how can we even talk about God being eternal since eternity itself is bound up in time and God invented time and he in fact existed and exists outside of time. So if he was there before time, how can we even talk about before? Because that's a time-bound term. And we said, huh. Huh. And we realize, and this is what Moses said to him too, and and God, he said, the moral of the story is, don't you dare waste any of this little bit of time that you've got. The one thing you won't be able to do in heaven is to lead somebody else to Jesus Christ. He said, don't you dare waste any time. And if you're not a saved person, he said, you want to pray right now. You want to believe in your heart that God is, Raise Jesus on the third day and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord right now. Because our lives are so short. But that God, he's eternal. In fact, he's more than eternal. He's greater than eternal. And then comes Psalm 91. And our hearts have already been prepared thanks to the worship team singing those beautiful lyrics. But when we come to realize who God is, we realize what his identity is, what his attributes are, what his qualities are. The first thing that happens is that we have no fear. Our fear is gone, just like the song said. Our fear is totally gone. Heaven takes it over. In verse 1, and there's a, by the way, there's a sermon outline in your bulletin. You can follow along and fill in the blanks there. I think there are only two or three. But the first, first blanks to fill in are no fear. And Psalm 91 verse 1 says that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, now I've got to hit the pause button right there because already there's a bunch there. He, and this means he or she, just so you know, the language conventions of the day were just masculine pronouns, so that means you two ladies. He or she that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. How many people dwell in the secret place of the Most High today? Do you dwell there? A lot of us want to dwell there. We want to be there. Well, hold on now. Who is the Most High? That name of God is Elyon. Elyon. And he is the Most High. And this word Elyon carries with it all this baggage that he is not just 
the first among many. He's not just the best. He's in a category completely and totally by himself. There's nobody who is second to God. There's nobody who's third. There's nobody who's a distant second. Because God is in and he is of his very own category. And this word, his name Elion, carries with it the fact that God is infinitely powerful. That God is infinitely knowledgeable. That God is infinitely present. He is infinitely wise. He is infinitely loving and graceful and merciful. And his judgment and his justice are perfect. He is perfect in his infinity and he is infinite in his perfect perfectness. That's what Elion carries with it. And so the verse says, "He that means you and me, he that dwelleth in the secret place of Elion shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And this word is Shaddai. You've heard the song, El Shaddai, El Shaddai. Shaddai talks specifically about God's power. And, you know, we see some pretty powerful things. We see that lightning when it crashes, and we see the wind come through, and one day it took Megan's trampoline and whipped it all the way, up, pulled out three stakes that had it staked into the yard, pulled it uphill, and just rammed it right up against the tree line. That power, that's nothing compared to the power of El Shaddai. El Shaddai! is so powerful that he created this entire universe whose ends we have not even seen in six days. And then he didn't even need to rest because he wasn't tired. He just rested to give us an example. He wasn't tired. Six days. That's how powerful Shaddai is. And so he that dwelleth in the secret place of Elion shall abide under the shadow of Shaddai. I will say of the Lord, in this case it's Yahweh, that's that it, that's the uh, interrelational, the relational name of God, the name he gave to Moses when Moses said, what is your name? He said, my name is I Am. He said, I am Yahweh. I am the relational God who wants to know you and have a relationship with you. I'm not just up there in the heavens somewhere. I want to be your God and I want you to be my people. That's Yahweh. He is my refuge, that is my maxe, and my fortress, Metsuda. A lot of Hebrew here today, but these words carry a lot of power with them. The English words don't even compare. So he is my maxe and my Metsuda, my God in him will I trust. And this time that God is back to Elohim, who we talked about last week. Elohim is our creator. The fourth word in the Bible, in the beginning, Elohim created everything that exists. Hallelujah. In him will I trust. So the question is, who are you going to trust? Who is going to be your fortress? Who is going to be your shield? Who is your marse? Who is your metsuda? Is it going to be, well, my dad can beat up your dad. Is it going to be, well, I've got all these diplomas hanging on my wall? Is it going to be the balance in my 401k, my 403b account? Is it going to be the title on my office door, the clothes or the car that I own? Or is it going to be Marseille, Metsuda, Elohim, Yahweh? Shaddai, Adonai. When we abide in that secret place, it's great to have a secret place. When when Megan was little, we used to love to climb this maple tree that's in the tree line between our property and the yard next door. And we would be up in that tree about 20 feet up, and nobody had any idea when we were there that we were there because the leaves were on the tree. Nobody, we could call down to people and they still didn't know we were up there. It's a secret place. We could play great tricks on people from up there. But the thing about being in a secret place is you're protected from everything else that goes on. You're in that secret place. Are you in the secret place of Elion this morning? 
If not, I'm going to show you how to get there. It's not that hard. He says, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. That's what the words of the song just said during our offering. Now when he says he's going to deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, that's somebody who hunts for birds, why would somebody who's hunting for birds want one of us? And furthermore, when you're hunting for birds, you don't, have you ever tried to catch a bird? I mean, even the chickens are almost impossible to catch. They're just a little too fast and they fly. So a fowler, somebody who's going to capture a bird, doesn't just chase them around trying to grab onto them. They set a trap. They, there's some kind of bait in there, just the way you catch a fish on a hook. So when God is delivering his people from the snare of the fowler, he's delivering us from temptation. Don't we pray that from him? Deliver us from temptation? Lead us not into evil? Yes. He's going to deliver us from that temptation and from the noisome pestilence. That noisome word is an old Victorian English word that means deadly. And we've got a lot of deadly things around here these days. We've got cancer and there are terrorist bombs and all sorts of bioterror type of agents and things like that. But there's something that's a lot more deadly than all those things. There's something that nobody has ever in the history of mankind been able to survive. And that's sin. Nobody has ever survived sin. The wages of sin is death. Period. There's no surviving it. He is going to deliver thee from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. And this is why I appreciate what Brian said so much about the truth of the word of God. If we're confused about what's true, we don't have that shield. We don't have that buckler, which is, by the way, just a little handheld shield. It's the truth that protects us. Verse 5 says, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by the day, nor for the pestilence that walk in the darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. In other words, what do we have to be afraid of when we are dwelling in the, the secret place of Elion? Nothing. We have nothing to fear. It was said of the great English theologian Charles Spurgeon that he feared God so much that he feared no man. Period. Even in the New Testament, we see in 1 John chapter 4, there is no fear in love, but perfect love driveth out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. In other words, if we have fear, it means that we are not understanding completely the love of Almighty God. If God, who completely transcends space, time, knowledge, history, everything else, he is Elion, he is the Most High El Shaddai, If he is protecting us, what do we have to be scared of? There's this little Hebrew word that says nothing. It wouldn't be translated into English, and what that means is nothing. You see? That's what we have to fear. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all this will be added unto you. He said you don't have to fear. So the first benefit that we receive from having a correct knowledge of who God is, is no fear. Now we can say, well, we have no fear, and that that might just be a feeling that's not really substantiated by anything. You know, you give people an hour-long self-defense class, and they're they're like Bill Cosby. They think they can beat up the world, right? Well, that's, that's what we call a false sense of security. But God is not going to give us a false sense of security because starting in verse 7, he says he's going to also give us his divine protection. Check this out. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Now, I picture myself in battle. Like this, where where all these soldiers are just going down and going down and going down. And I'm standing there and taking the battle to the enemy. Now we think of this in physical terms and it's clearly not talking about anything physical here because we see plenty of believers in Jesus Christ who die. 
In fact, until the rapture, we are all going to. And in fact, we see plenty of believers who die quite young and suffer quite a bit physically. So, and God's own son, don't forget, was subject to multiple illegal trials and was put to death for a crime that doesn't exist, of which he was never convicted. So this clearly can't talk about physical safety. He is talking about your spiritual safety. And by the way, we are not bodies with a spirit inside. We are spirits that happen to be in a body for a few short years. It's what counts that God is going to protect. It, so check this. A thousand shall fall at my side, ten thousand at my right hand, thy right hand, but it shall not come near thee. I become more and more convinced that God elects very, very few of us to salvation. And this is why this message is so very important. Because I want every single person in this room to be some of those few. But I think back to Noah's day. And I think back to how many people, estimates are that the population of the earth at Noah's time was two and a half to four million people. And God saved eight. I think, huh, I wonder how many people he's saving today. You look at the the number of people, even who are in the church this morning, compared to the population of the towns of Fabius and Pompey. And don't get me wrong, not everybody who's in church is saved, not everybody who's not in church is not saved. But take a representative sample. It's a small percentage. We could see 1,000 people perishing on our left and and 10,000 on our right spiritually perishing. Verse 8 says, Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, whether by death or by rapture, you're going to be with him in heaven when the really bad stuff starts to happen, when the great tribulation comes down. We're going to look with our eyes and see the reward of the wicked, but we won't have to endure it, we won't be a part of it, because thou hast made the Lord, that's Yahweh, which is thy, my refuge, Machse, even the most high, Elyon, thy habitation. Let me read that all in English. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is thy ref, my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. The reason that you get this protection is because you live, you abide, as Jesus said, in the Lord God Almighty. You reside in Elion. You reside in Shaddai. And there's no safer place to be in the universe. No ifs, no ands, no disclaimers. There's no safer place to be. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Now let me tell you something. Hebrews 1 and verse 14 tells us that his angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation. And if it were just God protecting us, wouldn't that be enough? It sure would. Absolutely. He is Shaddai. He is Elyon. But he still sends his angels. He himself would have been enough. But there's a bonus. It's like those infomercials. But wait, there's more. He sends his angels as well to protect us. So not only is he protecting us personally, he is also dispatching angels to be our protectors for those of us who are born again, who are saved by the blood of his son Jesus. Hallelujah. And they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thy dash thy dash the foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he, by the way, okay, we're switching to verse 14 here. And here, as this happens many times in the Psalms, the person changes. In other words, we've been talking about God in the the third person, for he, for he, for he. All of a sudden, God breaks in and he starts talking. It's like, here comes the voice in verse 14. Check this out. Because he, and again, it's he or she, it's talking about you, if you're saved today, if you've been born again, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. This is God talking here. 
And this is why I believe Psalm 91 is placed right after 90. In 90, it's Moses talking to God. In 91, it's God talking back and saying, yes, yes, Moses, and here's your reward for all this. First of all, you don't have to be afraid of anything. And second, I'm going to give you a reason not to be afraid of anything because I'm going to protect you from everything. He says, God says, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now remember, we're not talking about physical life here. We're talking about spiritual life. And when God talks about, I will give him long life, what kind of life is he talking about? He's talking about eternal life. Amen. And this brings it all full circle back to the eternality of God. These little bodies we've got, the scripture says they might last 70 or 80 years. Sometimes less, sometimes more. That's about all they get. They get high mileage and you can't replace the parts anymore. But God says, if you love me, if you honor me, if you keep me and you hold me and you glorify me, I will show you my salvation. I will give you long life. I will satisfy you. Did you catch that word? We talked about this last Sunday. He is our satisfaction. We don't need to seek satisfaction in the things of the world. We don't need to seek satisfaction in a pill. We don't need to seek satisfaction in a bank account and possessions, even in our family, because He becomes our satisfaction. In the worst of scenarios... I've got a friend who both, when she was in college, both her parents were killed in a car crash at the exact same time together. Where do you find your satisfaction at a time like that? You find your satisfaction in Shaddai, in Yahweh, in Elohim. So I promised I'd give you the secret here and I'm going to tell you how to get there, how to get to that secret place. First of all, he said that we are to dwell in that secret place. We are to make him our habitation, right? We are not just to pop in for a day when things get bad, when things get ugly. Well, pop in, break glass in case of emergency. No, he says we are to dwell there. Now, most of us, most of us here in this room, I think we dwell in central New York. We don't just drop in here now and then. We live here. We We abide here. He says, we are to abide in him like that. Jesus said, John 15, verse 7, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. He also said, John 14 and verse 15, if ye love me, ye will keep my commands. That's the test. Do we love him or don't we? If we love him, he says, we'll keep his commands. And when... Somebody asked Jesus what the greatest command was. Y'all know what he said. I like it best in Mark. Jesus answered, The first of all the commands is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. That's a lot of love. That's holding nothing back. That's not like 99 and 44 one hundredth percent pure love, that's one hundred percent pure love. And the scriptures tell us in Romans uh, chapter 10 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Would you bow your head with me and just close your eyes here this morning? And I want to give you an opportunity. There are, there are people in this room who are not yet born again, who have not made Elian their habitation, their Maxe, their Metsuda, who are not dwelling under the shadow of Shaddai and are troubled with fears, anxieties, worries, depression, addiction, any number of things. And you're just, you can't wait to step over the line 
It's to step across that threshold and abide in Him and to live in Him and to have that perfect divine protection because everything that troubles us is bound within time. We think about a snow day. <laughs> yes, this is the Psalm, Summer in the Psalm series, but we're thinking about snow days. And there's this day or two days when everything's shut down and nothing moves. And three days later, the pavement is dry and we're driving around and everything's fine because it's all about time. But the God I'm talking about, he invented time. He created time. He lives outside of time. And he is also Yahweh. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. But the only relationship, there's only one way to come to him and that is through his son, Jesus. And so with our eyes closed and our heads bowed this morning, if you have never committed your life to Jesus, if you have never declared him Lord, will you pray this with me right now? God, I know you're there. I know that you created everything that exists, including me. I know you made me in your image. And you want to be my God. And you want me to be your person, your daughter, your son. And right now, I confess of all the things I've done wrong. And I repent of them. And I know that I can't take them away. I can't work them away. I can't buy them away. But I acknowledge that you already did it. You already paid the price 2,000 years ago with the blood of the perfect sacrifice whose name is Jesus. From this day forward, he is my Savior and he is my Lord. In his name I pray. Amen. Would you read the words on the screen with me? This is a slightly different translation, but this is God's response back to the prayer of Moses that we read last week. He who dwells in the secret place of Elyon shall abide under the shadow of the Shaddai. I will say of the Yahweh, He is my Maxay, my Metzudah, my Elohim, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor the arrow that flies by day nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. But you have made the Yahweh, who is my Marse, even Elyon, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, I'm about to give the benediction, but afterwards, if you'd like to come up and have prayer with Steve, and I, I think, well, uh, Alexis is around, and, and Mike and Danielle, if you'd like to come up and have prayer with us, you're more than welcome to just, just kind of make your way up here. Nobody has to know about it. We'd love to pray with you and uh, talk with you, especially if you just prayed to receive Jesus as your Savior about three minutes ago. We'd love to chat with you about that. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord turn his face toward you 
and grant you peace. Amen.